I realize not every one of you is from the ad ecosystem here, but I assure you every one of you interacts with the ad ecosystem one way or another. So at a high level, users go to publisher sites like NewYorkTimes.com and try to go consume some content. Advertisers have the ability to serve some ads to showcase their service or brand in return for paying the publisher some money. In essence, you as a user are able to get rich content for the chance of seeing some ads. The model, in theory, leads to a pretty transparent and efficient ecosystem. However, there's a pretty big problem. Ad blocker growth has been exponential, and the problem is worse on mobile. And the ad industry is one of the very few industries where innovation is leading to worse user experiences. So does this mean that all ads are bad? A surprising survey by PageFair showed that ad block users uh, of 77% of ad block users actually don't mind some kind of ad formats. So the issue is not the ads themselves, it's what the ads actually do. And it's an important distinction. Here are some examples for, for why one would install an ad blocker. First is malvertising. Publishers face direct consequences when a random third-party ad server or, or ad network downloads a drive-by malware software or ends up redirecting, auto-redirecting users to um, illegitimate websites. There's no accountability about which particular ad tech company or ad network actually served the malware because these companies have gotten pretty good at cloaking and therefore serving ads to uh, proper ads to ad servers when they're trying to scan for malware or, or, or serve like really good uh, malware when the users end up, end up trying to uh, receive like actual ads. Next is Spectre. Most of you probably heard of Spectre, a vulnerability at the chipset level that opens up any ad in the world to become a privacy nightmare for you just by you consuming some content on your mobile device. Last but not least, cryptojacking. I don't know how many of you heard of this, but there's ad implementations in the wild right now that can actually just uh, take, take, consume a ton of battery and CPU from your mobile devices to harness uh, crypto mining. And these are all pretty bad experiences. And there's one thing that's common across all of them. And just like the Joker from the Batman movie, it's pretty unpredictable volatile, and completely unsafe, and that's arbitrary JavaScript. The fundamental architecture problem of the ads ecosystem is that it allows uh, actors and, and advertisers of, with potential malicious intent to s serve uh, arbitrary JavaScript to innocent publisher pages. And we want to fix this architectural issue. However, not all JavaScript is bad, right? You want the ability to, for example, uh, for, for advertisers at least, express your ads in a creative format um, in, a, in a pretty good visual way. Or you want to be able to tell the difference when an ad is being shown to a bot versus a real human being. And you need JavaScript for that. So we saw the bat signal. And the AMP project is here to help with AMP HTML ads. Ads that can't have arbitrary JavaScript. So in a nutshell, it's a spec based on AMP pages, and it works great for embeddability, and all of the code is declarative. Therefore, somebody trying to you know, add some arbitrary JavaScript with some malware can still do so, but it just won't be valid AMP HTML ad anymore. And therefore, the publisher or the ad library or the browser can decide to just not render it, depending on some sort of settings. All right, so let's take a quick look at what an AMP HTML ad looks like. It's pretty straightforward. It mostly looks like a regular AMP document, except that it's a different spec, and therefore uh, you need to comply with the uh, advertising or, or, or the ad spec. And we, we wanted to make sure that the, it was a more refined spec, so we don't allow things like, for example, an AMP iframe. That would be bad, because the ad would just embed the iframe, and I, an iframe could embed the ad again, and it's, it's not great. Um, this is a very simple example on line 13, as you can see, it's, it literally just goes and fetches an image um, with static sizes. But you can, of course, do really creative things. For example, here's a timeline-based animation entirely built in the AMP Animations framework, which is at a high level a wrapper around the Web Animations API 
with some not so secret uh, implementations. For example, when an animation is off screen, AMP can actually pause the animation, so saving the battery and CPU of the device. Because obviously, the, in, in the regular case, you can't know if the animation is on screen versus off. All right, so what about spam detection in more sort of advanced use cases? AMP HTML ads are fully extensible. Companies that offer innovative solutions like Moat uh, can easily integrate with AMP Analytics and offer viewability and spam detection services to ensure that you know, the ads that are actually viewed are, by human, uh, are viewed by human beings and not by bots. When using AMP Analytics, there's also a really nice side benefit where AMP Analytics is able to kind of batch all of the, the, all of the requirements and, and distribute it out to any number of requesters of, of that data. This is a very simple snippet that Moat is integrating uh, with AMP Analytics for. And publishers can simply place this, or advertisers when creating the ad can simply place this inside of the ad itself. You can also create really innovative ad formats. Here's just a few examples that we put together by just combining a few different AMP components. And again, by doing this, especially when it's served into an AMP page, we can do really cool things uh, from, from an innovation standpoint, but also uh, pause the animations when things kind of move off screen. Yesterday, you heard about AMP stories. And we are working on the ability to have just the AMP HTML ad infrastructure just work seamlessly with AMP stories. Traditionally, a bunch of ad developers would hand code all of these ads. But in this particular case, it's, it's really important to get the performance aspects right. But it, I do want to address a large variety of ad developers who do rely on tools to build really amazing looking ads, basically primarily with WYSIWYG editors. And to tell you more about Google Web Designer and its upcoming support for AMP HTML ads, I'd like to invite Heather Douglas, who's a senior software engineer at Google working on Google Web Designer. Thank you. Hello, so I'm Heather, and I'm a software engineer working on Google Web Designer. And I'm excited to be here today to show you some of the upcoming features that we've added to Google Web Designer for AMP HTML ads. So first, what is Google Web Designer, or GWD? So GWD is a tool for creating custom rich media creatives. It's already widely used for creating interactive animated HTML ads. And coming in March, we're adding support for AMP HTML ads. So as authors of AMP HTML ads, you may be wondering, what does that mean for you? So in addition to the standard content creation tools that we provide for HTML, we've done some enhancements specifically for AMP HTML ads. We've integrated directly with the AMP components so that you can use AMP components in your ads. And we have also integrated with the AMP event action system so that you can add interactivity to your ads. And then also, all animations in GWD use CSS. So we've created our own AMP component that works with the CSS that GWD generates so that you can control animation playback. And then we've also integrated directly with the AMP validator so that you'll always know the status of your ad, that it's valid. So rather than just tell you about these features, I'm going to do a quick demo to show you. Uh, so now we're ready to demo. And so what you'll see here is a pre-release build of Google Web Designer that already has AMP HTML ad support enabled. So all you do to create an AMP HTML ad is just create a new file. You'll see that there's some other options here for ads, but you want an AMP HTML banner. And so you have some options here for your ad environment the dimensions for your ad, and then the animation mode you want to be in. You'll understand that after the demo. So I'll just leave the defaults. So this is my main Google Web Designer workspace. Now, of course, you can arrange the panels how you want. So to begin with, I need to add some content to my ad to work with. So I'll do Import Assets. I'll add some logos and a Download button. And that adds them to the stage. 
It also adds them to your library panel for future reference. Now, I'll just put these into a rough position of where I want them to be so I can animate them. So now I want to add some text to my ad. And to do that, I can use the text tool. And we'll say Google Web Designer. Now supporting AMP HTML ads. And of course, I can format this text. change the size, and center it. Now I'm almost ready to start animating, but I want my text and my button to fade in later on. So I'm going to go ahead and select them and set their opacity to 0. So now to animate, all I do is add a keyframe and then change the position of my content. And I'll add another keyframe. And I'll fade in my text. And then one more keyframe, and I'll fade in my download button. So now you can preview this animation directly in the tool. You can also go ahead and change the duration of keyframes. And so now this animation looks about how I want it. But I want to add a loop so that the animation plays once before or twice before it shows the download button. So to do that, I have to use the advanced mode of the timeline. And this is actually where you can get more precise editing functionality for your animations. You can edit individual keyframes for individual elements. You can also scrub the timeline, see how your animation lines up. But what I want to do is I want to add an event and a label. So first, I'll add a label. And this is essentially just naming a point in the animation so that I can reference it in events. And then I'll go ahead and I'll add an event. And this is also just saying at this point in the animation, I want to trigger something else to happen. So to configure that, you can double click. And you'll see that there's a, a list of default or actions that you could take. You could toggle visibility on an element. Or in a multi-page ad, you could go to a different page. But I want a timeline event, go to and play a set number of times. And my animation is on page one. And I want it to repeat once. So now at this point, you actually have to preview in a browser because it uses the animation runtime. And now you have an animated ad. But of course, when someone clicks on the download button, I want it to take them to the download page for Google Web Designer. So I'll go ahead and add an event. And this time, I have to choose that on mouse tap. Uh, when you have a tap event, you have this special exit event. And I want to exit the ad. And I want to go to the download page for Google Web Designer. So I can preview this in the browser again. And there you have a fully functioning, animated, interactive AMP HTML ad. So there are just a couple more things that I wanted to show you. I told you that we integrate with the ad validator directly. So that's over in our ad validator panel. This will show you the size of your ad. There's also some checks for the environment that you're going to be running in. And then here is the AMP validation status. And you can see that this is valid AMP HTML. And just to show you what it looks like when you're not valid, I'll go ahead and add some CSS, which I know is not allowed. And you see you get a little warning message that you need to check your validation. So one more thing is you might be wondering what the document that is generated actually looks like. Or you might have a specific change that would be easier to make in a code view. So you can switch over to code view. And this is the actual ad that you're creating. And you see it uses the AMP for ad spec. It has the standard boilerplate. And you have your CSS for the ad. 
And then, of course, all of your images are AMP images, and it includes the AMP components that you're using and the configuration for the components. And you can even see the exit event that's been configured using the event system. So one final step that you're going to need to do is you're going to have to publish your ad. And you can do this either locally or to Google Drive. And basically, this will give you a summary of your ad. And then it will create a zip file that includes the document and any assets that you've used. So this was just a quick demo for a basic ad. I wanted to show you an ad that one of my coworkers created, a sample that has some more interactivity. Go ahead and preview this. When you click on a product, you can see more details. So this was just a quick intro to Google Web Designer. Of course, there's more functionality, which I didn't have time to show. You can create templates. You can do multi-page ads. Uh, and we are launching with support for the AMP carousel component. And support for other components will be coming soon. And as I said, this is a pre-release build. But we're planning to launch this on March 21st with support for AdWords. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what you all create. Thanks. OK, wasn't that great? We can't wait to see what developers do with that and try not to fall. <laughs> OK, so let's, let's move on. So from ad creation, now we need to talk about how the serving aspects work of this ad, uh, of the AMP HTML ads. So if you paid attention through all of what I talked about, you're probably thinking to yourself, but wait, the ad server can still cheat and kind of call yourself AMP HTML ads, but still spread malware, right? However, AMP HTML ads ship with a built-in trust, a trust model. We have more than one ways to do this, uh, three, essentially. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the first two. But let's, let's talk about the first one first. Of course, uh, it's called server-side signing. Typically, the browser uh, makes an ad request, but it's really the ad library that's making the ad request out to the ad server, at which point an ad server would conduct uh, an auction. In this particular case, let's assume it's a, it's a car advertiser, a bike advertiser, and a bicycle advertiser. Say the impression in this particular case, the car advertiser wins by bidding the highest amount of uh, CPM for it, and therefore returns back with an AMP HTML ad. At which point, the ad server needs to sign the AMP HTML ad with its private key and return it back to the ad library. And the ad library, using the public key that's already been submitted by the ad server on GitHub, can verify to make sure it's actually valid. And this is one way we use server-side signing. But the problem in this case is the ad server needs to be trusted to have like the right keys in the right place. And it can also be pretty cumbersome, especially if you're a smallish ad network to do this. And therefore, we wanted to ensure there was another way that that's easy to bootstrap and also start to sign. So Cloudflare, a third party company, offers any ad server to sign ad, ad responses. The browser ad library in this case would belong to Cloudflare. And Similarly, uh, all of everything else stays the same, but Cloudflare will take care of on an impression basis, or they also offer you know, uh, hosting your, your sort of uh, requests via routing them via their CDN um, to be signed and delivered. But today, we're announcing a third way to manage this built-in trust model. And to tell you all about it, I'd like to invite James Avery, who's the CEO of AdZerk. James. Hello, uh, happy to be here. Uh, my name is James Avery. I'm the CEO of AdZerk. Uh, and today, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about us real quick, and then I'll dig into what we've been doing with AMP. Uh, so we are essentially an API company. So we work with developers at really interesting publishers like Reddit and Strava and Wattpad. Uh, and we help them build really innovative ads, right? So we think that there's a lot can be improved in ads. We provide an API that helps do that. So. Uh, you know, I was a developer in the past, and there's a lot of developers in the room. Uh, if you ask a developer what's the first thing they normally say about ads, they say ads suck. 
right? So why do they suck? So if you go to a random page and you look at how long it takes the page to load or how many requests there are, uh, and then you think about how many are coming from ads. So we've looked at pages that literally have 4,000 requests that are made for ads. So you guys are building these super sleek pages that are super efficient, and then there's 4,000 requests for ads on them. Uh, we think that's a pretty big problem. Uh, they also, it, you know, that's eating up mobile data, right? So everybody's worried about how much data they have, how much, you know, is happening on their phone. Uh, and, you know, this is only eating up that data. If you look at the page load, uh, the page size that you're creating as a developer uh, versus what's loaded through ads, uh, it's, it's pretty depressing. Um, this is why so many people in this room probably run ad block, right? Because it helps your mobile data and things like that. Um, it also leaks sensitive data. So Vamsi talked about this a little bit with malware and things like that, but uh, also like it's your cookies are being shared with third parties that you've never talked to. You know, your IP address is being shared with them. All of this stuff is happening as these ads are loading. And as a publisher, you actually don't have as much control as you think because of all these auctions happening and all this stuff happening in the ecosystem. It ends up where, you know, there could be people serving ads on your site that you don't know who they are. Uh, it could just be some third-party ad network that bought you know, an ad on your site, and now it's showing up. Uh, this is only going to become a lot more important with GDPR, which you know, we're in Europe, so I think most people here probably are already worried about GDPR. It's coming very soon. Uh, companies are going to be on the hook for millions of dollars or euros uh, if they leak personal information. So how can you control what's happening on your site if you're just running people's JavaScript, right? Also, uh, malware and redirects. Uh, you know, malware is a really big problem, but if you're in ad ops, I think there are a couple people here probably in ad ops or, or deal with that. Uh, redirects are like the scourge of ad ops. So, you know, when you go to a mobile site and you're just, you're trying to find a, you know, a cafe and you click on a link and then it redirects you automatically to the app store or it redirects you to a site that then pops up like six pop-ups. Uh, publishers don't want that. No publisher wants that, but it sneaks in there. Uh, and a lot of the ways they do this is they run those on, you know, Saturday night at 3 a.m. And so then all the guys are asleep and they get paged and their boss calls them because somebody posted to, you know, a forum complaining about redirects in your app. So another really big issue. Uh, and then fraud, right? Because there's all this ambiguous stuff going on, people can start buying your inventory and then reselling your inventory, you know, or they can do all kinds of stuff like this that's just costing you money as a publisher. So. Uh, we'd like to, we think we have an interesting solution to this. Um, so how do we fix ads, right? So we think that, I think what, what Vamsi's doing in the ads HTML stuff is really good. Um, and we've actually been supporting that for a while. We work with Cloudflare. One of our customers, Cox Media, is out there somewhere. Um, works with us to sign ads, uh, ads, you know, HTML or AMP HTML ads. Um, and that works really well. But we think fundamentally as developers, and you know, as product people, ads shouldn't be able to use any JavaScript, right? Like we just cannot trust that JavaScript is coming back. So we believe there should be no JavaScript. Um, we believe they should make a single fast call, right? You know, it should be a single call to the server to say, I need ads to monetize this site. We shouldn't have to make 12, let alone the thousands that sometimes happen. And then also, we should return the minimum amount of data needed. You know, we're all developers, we all care about that client to server relationship and what we're returning, you know, why would you, you'd never write an app that called the server and then the server returned like a script tag that then executed some other script tags and then randomly put stuff in there. Maybe a couple years ago we might have, but we wouldn't now. Um, and then they should follow an explicit interface, right? Like we should tell the advertisers the only thing we're willing to accept from them and how that will load onto our site. Um, and they should adhere to that interface. So uh, this is partially what we do at AdZert. So we have a decision API. Um, this allows server-to-server -server calls. It allows client-to-server calls all through a simple API. I'm not going to sit here and pitch our product, but you know, it's basically ad server as an API. But so talking to the AMP team, we wanted to figure out a way to mash up what we've done as like a decision API, and how do we get that to work with AMP? Um, because a lot of the customers who work with do server-to-server. -server. You don't want to necessarily do that with AMP, because you want your AMP stuff to be cached. You want to load really quick. You don't want to do a server-to-server -server call. You want it to happen through the AMP uh, interface. So this is where we've worked with uh, the AMP team. Uh, and they've been really great in uh, helping us figure all this out and how to do it. Uh, so we have an AMP ad tag, which is kind of a standard AMP ad tag. 
uh, set to add Zerk. Um, and then what we do is we have a uh, template. Uh, so there's a template that is in the AMP cache. And so it's a, I'll show all this in a second. Um, it's just a simple AMP template. And then the, uh, you make a call to add Zerk. We return a simple amount of data. Uh, and then that's rendered in the template. So let me go to the next step. It's a little easier. So here's the AMP tag. You know, pretty simple. If you've ever worked with AMP ads, this is what it looks like. It's, you know, type ad Zerk, a little data around your site ID and things like that, like the, what ad size you want. And then this is the really cool part, is that all we're returning is this JSON, right? So it's just a simple amount of JSON that we return from the server that will decide what ad to run. And so we have like a URL, which is like where we're gonna uh, redirect the user when they click. Um, we have an external URL, which is just the link to our CDN image. We have like a title, width, height, and then the impression URL is what we use to track that somebody has seen this ad. Um, and then what we have is our simple template. And so this is a template that's loaded, it's just mustache, it's just loaded into the uh, AMP cache. Um, and we load this once. So a user like, loads this template, it's in their cache, and then every time they see an ad, it can render on this template. So I mean, this is, you know, That'd be kind of anticlimactic to just show an ad, but there's an ad, and it's from uh, you know, loading through this template, and it's kind of all this stuff that's going on to do that. Uh, so the benefits of this, you know, we have no third-party JavaScript at all. We're just passing back JSON. You know, advertisers can only pass you back that simple interface that you've accepted. Uh, all the rendering is done client-side. You know, if you guys are building new apps today, you're using React and Angular and stuff like that, right? That's so you can do all the rendering on the client side. So you can get simple API responses back and do your rendering on the client side. We think the same, the same thing should apply to ads. Uh, the payload reduces over by 50%, or payload reduced by over 50%. So because we're not sending back all that HTML every time, or even the AMP ad HTML, we're just sending back the JSON, we reduce the payload by over 50%, and that's on that simple ad. And so if you get into the kind of the complex, animated, stuff like that, the payload reduction is going to be even more dramatic. And then also templates are cached, right? And so I've talked about this like three times, but I think it's the coolest part is that these templates are cached in the client, and so the stuff is loading really, really quick. Um, so that's, that's pretty much all I want to talk about. I think it's a pretty interesting uh, uh, thing. Um, but I do, and I will say too, like this is just an example of a simple template. Um, we could, you could run, you know, you could create any template you want for any type of AMP HTML ad. Uh, so some of the stuff that we saw in Google Web Designer, uh, like that cool shopping, you know, with the different items, you know, you could create that as a template for your site, and then advertisers could bid in with JSON to promote their, their uh, products or their retargeted products, things like that. So uh, that's all I've got. Um, so please, if you're interested in talking to us about doing this on your publisher site or helping to improve ads and speed things up, like please get in touch. Happy to talk. Thank you, James. We also really enjoyed working with you. Cool. A number of partners all over the entire ecosystem have already started to experiment and start to deliver AMP HTML ads, um, you know, promoting a safer and a faster ad standard. For those of you who haven't seen it before, it's interesting to note the comparison between an AMP HTML ad and a regular ad in, in real life. So on my right side is an AMP HTML ad, and on my left side is a regular ad. They essentially look the same, but you can see how much faster the ad actually renders. So how are these AMP HTML ads performing from a revenue standpoint? Because of course, they need to be able to make money, right? We've had a few partners try it out in production, and the results are pretty great. First is El País, who is a large Spanish news publisher. And they saw that the latency uh, with AMP HTML ads was reduced by not close to 90%. And as a, as a result, the click-through rates jumped up to 32% higher. Logic Ad, who's a demand-side platform from Japan, also saw very similar results. And to be clear, these numbers are controlled by removing the benefits that AMP HTML ads receive when inside of an AMP page from a prioritization standpoint. So OK, AMP pages are growing, but they're still not as, much, as many as you know, the entire web, right? They're still a small subset. So we wanted to ensure that AMP HTML ads just seamlessly worked with uh, non-AMP pages, too. And in a few quarters, we're also working on the ability for AMP HTML ads to work inside of mobile apps. 
So as an advertiser, you can just create one ad and have it work across all the platforms, be it mobile, desktop, AMP, or non-AMP, or inside of mobile app. Okay, so switching gears, let's talk about AMP pages and the monetization of regular ads on AMP pages. So from day one, we wanted to ensure that regular ads and the existing ecosystem just worked. However, we wanted to ensure that the user experience elements were great on AMP pages. For example, we took care of things like uh, AMP pages can't have interstitials blocking the content that the user in the first place came to the site for, or uh, the fact that AMP, AMP, uh, AMP does not allow ads to be non-static in that you have to have uh, definitions on the AMP page uh, so that you don't, you probably experienced this where you're trying to read a content and the ad's like trying to dynamically size itself so it pushes content down and you're trying to scroll again, it's just a nightmare. So none of that's possible in AMP, so that's a pretty good user experience. And we also ensured that ads are always served into iframes with pretty tight sandbox requirements, and therefore um, auto redirects will, won't, can't happen. And along with all these good user experience standards, we started to optimize for revenue. And we can do that because with AMP pages, we control the entire lifecycle of rendering the ad and the rest of the page. And we saw pretty amazing stats. So this is just numbers based on double-click ad exchange and AdSense, and we're seeing an increase of 318% in terms of impressions and 3x increase in ad revenue uh, just paid out to the publishers over the last 12 months. Also note that all of this revenue is purely for just from ad exchange and AdSense. Publishers earn even more by being able to just directly place their own ads, which is not calculated in these numbers. These improvements come from a few different places. First, publishers are starting to put more number of uh, ads on their pages uh, and essentially bringing the number of ads inside of their AMP pages to be equal to the number of ads on their non-AMP pages. Uh, of course, more publishers are starting to opt into placing ads in the first place. And finally, the AMP team and a number of ad networks are finally trying to optimize the entire. Uh, so if you think about it, we've built a pretty tight ecosystem where we'll not compromise on the user experience. And keeping that tight, every, ad networks and, and the AMP team are trying to optimize for revenue. So, and therefore, publishers are able to see these big, massive revenue gains over the last 12 months. And also from day one, we wanted to ensure that there was a diverse set of ad networks that were supported in AMP pages. So today, there's about more than 100 plus ad networks that are paying out uh, revenue to publishers. And just to iterate, AMP will never or doesn't ever take any sort of rev share from any of these ad networks. So all of the money is going directly to the ad networks or to the publishers. Individual publishers are also seeing pretty great revenue increases. So for example, India Today, who is a large publisher from India, is seeing an increase of 23% in revenue per page. But the amazing thing is they were able to get this with fewer number of ads on AMP pages compared to their non-AMP pages. So today we're lucky to have one such publisher who is working really hard on optimizing their inventory uh, to, to see such revenue gains as well. I'd like to invite Adam Leslie, who's the head of commercial operations at metro.co.uk, to work us through their sort of journey to get better revenue. Yes. Hi, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, so for anyone who has never heard of metro.co.uk before, we are one of the fastest growing newspaper websites, according to the Press Gazette's ABCs. We have, we're based in London, but we also have offices in New York, and we are written by millennials, for millennials, covering a number of different topics, everything from news to sport to showbiz. It's also worth noting that we're part of the same group as the Mail Online, and commercially, there's some collaboration there, which is something that I talk about later on in my presentation. So header bidding is a concept that publishers have been using uh, in their standard web pages for several years to greatly increase the amount of uh, people who are bidding for each individual ad placement. And the way that this works is that you have some wrapper tag in the head of your page, which essentially initializes calls to all of the different bidders that you have uh, that you want to work with. 
The wrapper will then get all of the responses, uh, mediate the best price, and the output will be the best price across all of your bidders as a key value and a cached asset on the client. The price as a key value then gets passed to the ad call, which is in a friendly iframe. Uh, and if the wrapper has the best price, then a command is served is a command to serve from the ad server to render the asset from cache. So for AMP, uh, we start running into issues because the wrapper itself and the calls to all of the bidders are essentially JavaScript that sits directly on the client, which is not allowed within AMP for speed benefits. Equally, as Vamsi mentioned, the iframes that we use in AMP, the AMP ad iframes, uh, are not friendly. They are safe frames, which make passing key values into them uh, not possible or very difficult. So for these reasons, whenever we initially launched uh, AMP about two years ago on the mail line, we were unable to replicate this method within AMP. However, over the past 12 months, there's been a lot of developments within server-side bidding that has helped us create some solution within AMP pages. So for AMP, what we've been doing is using the remote HTML method to call some pre-bid server configuration. And what that means is that before we generate every ad call, we call some remote document that hosts our configuration for pre-bid. On, on the remote page, we then go through a similar process where we call all of our bidders, get the best price back as a key value. And what's then delivered back to the AMP ad iframe is a key value along with a secondary iframe containing the code for the winning asset. Now, I just want to clarify that this all happens within the AMP ad iframe. Uh, and that the AMP ad iframe that I'm discussing has a type double click uh, configuration. So it's not, no, no different from what a lot, of other a lot of publishers are already using. So before, you would have been running uh, an ad setup which would have your direct campaigns competing with Google Ad Exchange, potentially bolstered by some exchange bidding demand. However, afterwards, you get the direct benefit of uh, the pre bid demand. However, the Google Ad Exchange also then has to work harder to win the impressions off of pre-bid. So you get that indirect benefit as well. So for Metro.co.uk, I rolled this out in the first week of June. There's quite a lot of views here, but I'm going to go through all of them individually. So on the left-hand side, I have a stacked view of the revenue by day. So you've got Ad Exchange with uh, pre-bid demand stacked on top of it, uh, and you can see Start of, uh, start of June, the, literally the first day that we deployed, we started making more money. Uh, with us now you know, tracking it several times the previous run rate whenever we weren't running um, pre-bidge in AMP. On the right-hand side, we have a view of the RCPM, which is the, essentially the amount of money we get paid for every 1,000 adverts. Whilst there's a lot of noise and variation, it's pretty clear that there's a very strong upward trajectory on the RCPM. So pre versus post, we're looking at an increase on the overall AMP CPM of about 98%, with about a 49% increase in the Google Ad Exchange CPM, which is that indirect benefit that I mentioned earlier. Over the period of May to December, which is the window that I focused on for this presentation, we had, due to editorial optimizations and just general traffic growth, we saw an increase in the amount of available ad impressions of 198%. However, over the same period, we saw an increase in the revenue of 573%, which means that we managed to grow the revenue at nearly three times the rate that we managed to grow the rate of available impressions. So this sort of growth can't really be explained of anything outside of enabling the, the pre-bid within AMP. So after the successes that we saw on Metro.co.uk, I was then tasked with rolling out the same uh, uh, method or framework on the Mail Online. And for the Mail Online, we went live in about the last week of July, observing very similar trends. So the day one of deploying, we were making more money, but it's now tracking it you know, several times the previous run rate. On the right-hand side, again, we have the same view of the RCPM observing, again, a very strong upper trajectory in the RCPM. So pre versus post, we're looking at a 92% increase in the overall AMP CPM with a 72% increase in the Google Ad Exchange AMP CPM. The, the amount of available impressions didn't grow as much. However, it is worth noting that the revenue did grow three times faster than the rate uh, of available impressions grew for the mail line specifically. So in preparation for coming and speaking about this today, uh, I've done a bit of an audit across all of the publishers that I have behind me. Uh, these publishers are all ad-funded like ourselves. They're all using uh, the double-click element. And only one of the publishers on this slide was actually using the method that I've been running through today. 
which means that there's a lot of opportunity for publishers to enable this technology within AMP to make a lot more money. However, it's worth noting that the method that they use probably won't be what I've been describing today, because both delayed fetch and the remote HTML are going to be deprecated in about a month and a half. However, due to the, su due to the successes that we've seen uh, after enabling pre-bid within AMP, as soon as we found out about the deprecation, we've been working very closely with both pre-bid and AMP to ensure that some alternative solution uh, was available before the deprecation. We're very excited to see a lot of the work that's happening with Prebage within the uh, real-time configs uh, protocol. So looking through the real-time configurations documentation uh, and understanding you know, Prebage and working with it quite closely, this is a very rough representation of how Prebage could work within remote uh, real-time configs. However, I'm actually not going to explain uh, this that much because it's something that we're going to go into in a lot more detail later on in the session. So closing thoughts for myself. More publishers should definitely be looking to do this. However, they should probably wait until re the real-time config method is uh, available. The, whilst the method or the technology is changing, the outcome isn't. In fact, it may even be better. There's certain benefits by us not being on, uh, by, us not, uh, by us still using remote HTML uh, that we're not currently seeing, mainly the fast fetch. So we're still using delayed fetch, not using fast fetch. So by us moving the same method across to a fast fast fetch infrastructure, it may actually mean that the revenue upticks are even better because the efforts load faster. The next point is that this method is not unique to prebid. So whilst, from my understanding or from what I've seen in the market, prebid is the only wrapper that offers a documented solution for AMP. Technically speaking, any any uh, wrapper that has server side bidding capabilities should and probably could, uh, could and probably should uh, build out some sort of solution for AMP. So if your wrapper of choice is not pre-bid and it's not an option for you to utilize that, then you should definitely be speaking to the wrapper that you do use to ensure that this is on their product roadmap. The next point is uh, a bit of an issue that we've spotted with uh, pre-bid server, specifically within Europe. Uh, some, of the other bidder, some of the bidders uh, currently don't work that well within Europe. So if you're tied on dev time and you're mainly European in traffic, you might want to focus your dev time on just that Nexus and Rubicon. However, that issue should be resolved within the next few months. And finally, if you are a global publisher who trades off a single domain, it may be that you have different commercial teams in different regions, and it may also mean that you're using different wrappers in different regions. And this is something that is not currently possible in AMP because the configs that you post are global. Because this is of uh, interest to us, we've been working closely with the AMP team to come up with a solution on this. And the current thought process is to make some changes or make some developments to the AMP Dynamics CSS classes component to essentially encompass some sort of geo uh, differentiation. All right, that's everything from me. Uh, I'm around for the rest of the day. If you have any questions, feel free to come and grab me, but I'll also be in the Q&A later on. Thanks very much. Back to Vamsi. There's a lot that goes into this stuff, doesn't it? All right, thank you, Adam. So just switching gears, we wanted to make sure that we give you just a brief overview of all the features that we launched from a monetization perspective to help publishers make more revenue within AMP over the last few months. The first is single request architecture, or SRA. It's basically the ability to sort of combine all the ad requests into one single um, ad request, all the ad slots in one single ad request, and make them to the ad server. What this allows, especially for larger publishers and advertisers, is to be able to tell a story across the entire page um, based on sort of the sequencing of the different creatives. Or, for example, competitive exclusions where, let's say, Coke is trying to buy out the entire page, um, they don't want a Pepsi ad, and therefore the ad server needs to know, that all of the, uh, know all of the ad slots within the page and the sequencing for them. Next is auto ad refresh, where, say, a publisher creates an interactive, uh, which only lasts one single viewport, and therefore the user is spending most of their time within this one single viewport, and they want to be able to, and therefore the publisher should be able to sort of monetize them uh, by defining sort of a set interval for the ad to refresh at that point. However, we've added self sensible restrictions where we're saying, oh, the ad can't actually refresh in under 30 seconds. Native ads are all the rage, and for good reason. Um, they are not as jarring, and they're also pretty seamlessly integrated with the rest of the content. 
and therefore um, we've launched Fluid Ads, and which gives the ability to kind of take over the entire space available dynamically by a certain ad. For example, in most cases, this is up to the device width of the viewport. AMP IMA Video provides the ability to start to monetize your video content. Um, it's a free AMP component that ships with a video player and easily monetizes based on from, di from different ad network, video ad networks, including double clicks. It works seamlessly with, uh, with um, all of the other ad networks as well, and uh, so publishers should take advantage of this. Last but not least is real-time config that Adam sort of briefly talked about. Uh, but basically, it is not just for header bidding, but it, it opens up a number of different possibilities for publishers, like being able to enhance the audience data um, on, on incoming requests or do sort of geo-based targeting. So for example, similar to how a barista might pull a, pull a shot just before making your cappuccino, real-time config allows you to enhance the ad request just in time before making the call out to the ad server to get the highest sort of eCPMs. And to tell you more about just one application of RTC, I'd like to invite Matt Jacobson, who's a product manager at AppNexus, uh, to give you a brief overview of their integration. Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt. I'm a product manager for AppNexus. And today, I'm also here as a product manager representing prebid.org. So, a couple of minutes ago, we heard from Adam, and he gave us some examples about how publishers are already using uh, pre-bid solutions. Uh, publishers like Metro.co.uk and the Mail Online are already using pre-bid to optimize monetization across uh, some of their AMP pages. Um, so today, I want to give you a bit of background as to what exactly is the pre-bid organization uh, and discuss one of the ways that we're actively collaborating with these types of publishers and with the AMP team. Uh, to contribute to the long-term viability of the open and programmatic advertising ecosystem. So what is prebid.org? Well, prebid.org is an open source foundation, and you can find us on GitHub. Uh, but really, prebid.org is a collaboration uh, across a number of industry partners, all of whom are dedicated to the development of an independent and open source header bidding solution uh, and efficient programmatic monetization through fair competition. So prebid.org manages a number of projects, some of which you might be familiar with, but I'll go through a few of the key ones here. Uh, first, then the original project is prebid.js, which is an open source and independent client-side header bidding wrapper. Second is prebid server, uh, which is an open source implementation for server-to-server -server header bidding. We also manage iOS and Android SDKs, which are designed to work with prebid server and provide prebid demand for mobile app publishers. And we manage a number of other tools as well, uh, like Headerbit Expert, which is a browser extension designed to facilitate troubleshooting and monitoring of header bidding setups. So just as a sense of scale, uh, publishers are using prebid today to drive programmatic revenue to more than 35 billion impressions per day across more than 25,000 websites. And prebid is also a vibrant open source community with more than 250 individual contributors. Um, and Prebit offers more than 100 adapters, including both client-side and server-side demand partner adapters, uh, analytics provider adapters, ad server adapters, and more. So despite the fact that Prebit and AMP were originally created to achieve different ends, uh, really, in terms of their core values, they're not too dissimilar from each other. So Prebit and AMP are both open source projects. They're both looking to drive uh, greater transparency and accountability into the ecosystem. And they both have a deep focus on performance and end user experience. So given this shared commitment to core values and principles in a lot of ways, uh, collaboration between these two projects makes a lot of sense. So earlier, Adam uh, explained how he's using a remote.html file to fetch prebid demand. And this certainly works. Uh, the problem with this, though, is that AMP fast fetch does not allow for the execution of custom JavaScript. So our goal became how can we enable publishers to access pre-bid demand through AMP fast fetch pipes? So I'm happy to say that in collaboration with publishers and in, with the AMP ads team, uh, we're solving for this issue by enabling pre-bid server to be called as an AMP RTC vendor, which can return slot level targeting through JSON RTC responses. So the story of our mutual collaboration here probably started last April. 
Uh, this is when the AmpAds team released their first uh, spec, their first intent to implement for AmpAd real-time configs. Uh, and as pre-bid, we recognized the potential value here, but there were a number of issues for us. So first of all, the original proposal only allowed for a single RTC callout, which means that a publisher wouldn't be able to say both access header bidding demand and also uh, other information, other targeting information or other data pre-auction. Uh, and also, there was no ability to set uh, slot level targeting, which pre-bid relies heavily upon to ensure that we're able to associate bids from demand partners with individual ad units. So after some back and forth, and a few months later, uh, a new proposal was released, this time called AMP RTC2. Uh, so with this new proposal, uh, up to five RTC callouts were supported. And critically, RTC callouts would be supported per slot, which means that pre-bid had the ability to associate uh, targeting on a slot level and associate bids from demand partners with individual ad units. So as you might expect, along the way, we encountered a few other minor issues. Uh, and we're still working with uh, publishers and with the AMP Ads team to solve for some of them. And we'll continue working to optimize this type of integration for publishers. Uh, but the key result here, the key takeaway, uh, is that we have been able to add RTC support to pre-bid. And so we will, be enabled, we will be able to enable publishers to access header bidding demand through AMP fast fetch networks. So I'll briefly touch on some of the requirements here and for running pre-bid with AMP RTC. And hopefully, we'll all agree that uh, there's nothing too particularly arduous here. So first, you'll need to be running some AMP ad elements for a network that supports fast fetch and AMP RTC, a network like DoubleClick, for example. Uh, second, you'll need to create some server-side pre-bid configurations. And a configuration here is essentially just a list of the demand partners that you're working with and their respective parameters. Uh, and third, on your AMP ad units, uh, you'll need to define an RTC config attributes, uh, which will make a call to prebid server as a vendor and which will define any parameters necessary for prebid server to be able to retrieve the configuration information server side. So here's what this looks like. Uh, and I won't go through every single step here because that's what the documentation is for. And uh, I can tell that everybody's sort of getting ready for lunch. Um, but essentially how it works is you've already got your AMP ad element for a network like DoubleClick that supports fast fetch and AMP RTC, and you've defined prebid server as your RTC vendor. So the AMP runtime will make a call to prebid server, which will then use that parameter value to retrieve the demand partner configuration server side. Uh, and prebid server will then make some server side bid requests to your demand partners. Your demand partners will return server-side bid responses to pre-bid server, essentially containing a price and creative content. And that creative content will all be cached server-side. And then based on those uh, bid responses, pre-bid server will send back a JSON targeting response to the AMP runtime, uh, containing your slot level pre-bid key value targeting. Uh, and the, the AMP network will then use this JSON targeting to construct an ad request URL. And if a pre-bid pre demand wins, uh, the shell creative that serves back to the AMP runtime will then retrieve the final demand partner creative content from the server-side cache, which will render into your AMP ad unit. So we're all very excited about this. Uh, and we should, we'll be looking forward to testing this out with uh, hopefully with some of you in the coming weeks. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Vamsi. Cool. Home stretch, folks. All right. Um, just to summarize, there's four key takeaways today. The first one is that AMP HTML ads are safer and better from an ROI perspective for both publishers and advertisers. Second, that the AMP monetization is growing. Third, we've launched a number of different features to allow publishers to monetize AMP pages better. And fourth, header bidding is supported within AMP now. Uh, using real-time config, but it's just one use case. And overall, it's a platform. And we look forward to what developers are going to do with the entire platform. So just briefly looking ahead, we wanted to ensure that there's a continued uh, interoperability of AMP pages supporting regular ads, which is the vast majority of, of uh, ads within AMP pages. But also, we want to ensure that the AMP HTML ads work seamlessly across other platforms, including non-AMP pages. It's a large ecosystem, but our vision really is to get, ultimately get the best of both worlds. 
By combining the two experiences, we believe that we'll end up in an advertising ecosystem that is a step function better. And an advertising ecosystem that negates the need for ad blockers and promotes an open and sustainable web. And I'd like to thank you for your time today.